this video, we're going to be looking at how can we apply the particle in a box model that we have studied to some examples in organic chemistry. In this particular case, conjugation that you have in molecules, polyenes, pi systems. Now, remember that for those pi systems, you have in principle conjugated double bonds that are forming are formed because you have hybridization sp2 in your carbons. The idea with that hybridization is that there is one p orbital for each one of those carbons participating in these double bonds, and then you can have um, in, in principle, you can have the delocalization of those pi electrons over the entire system. Thinking about in that way, you can then say, well, one of those pi electrons that are delocalized all around my molecule can be modeled as a electron that is confined in a box whose dimensions is the size of the molecule. The electron cannot move further down the extension or the extent of the molecule. And also, we can think about the energy levels represented for those energy levels in a particle in a box as uh, correlated with the pi orbitals that are formed in your system. Remember that you're going to have bonding and anti-bonding, and also the highest occupied molecular orbital, I'm going to be referring to that as HOMO, and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, referred here as LUMO, is the difference between those two levels. That's the energy that is going to be involved in those uh, transitions. So, for example, in the case where you have one double bond, you have uh, two, um, you have uh, one pi orbital that is bonding, one pi orbital that is anti-bonding, you have two pi electrons, so they're filling up uh, the ground state and one an energy level in your particle in a box. If there's some excitation with the proper amount of energy, there's going to be a transition between n equals 1 to n equals 2, and that energy, difference in energy, is the one that is being analyzed in your UV spectroscopy, for example. Well, similarly, if you have for a molecule that contains now two double bonds, uh, you're going to have two pi orbitals that are bonding, two pi orbitals that are anti-bonding. Uh, excitation with the proper amount of light is going to give you a uh, electron transition from HOMO to LUMO, and in this case, um, again, thinking in the, in the language of particle in a box, the HOMO will correspond to the energy level n equals 2, and the transition where the electron lands, finally, it's going to be n equals 3. So if you keep doing this analysis for molecules that contains three double bonds, four double bonds, and more, uh, what you will find is that the number of double bonds will correspond to the, um, the energy level in your particle in a box where the transition originates. Again, for one double bond, n equals is going to be 1. For two double bonds, n is going to be equal to 2. And then the transition where it goes, it's going to be n plus 1, so it'll be d plus 1. Another thing that we have to take into consideration is the length of the box. For this, we're going to do this simplification. Of course, double bonds and single bonds are uh, different in length, but we're going to just take sort of like the average between the two of them. So we're going to count that the um, the length of the chain, which is going to be equal to the length of, of the box in the particle in a box model, um, is going to be equal to 2 times the number of double bonds minus 1 multiplied by the length of each carbon-carbon um, bonds. And again, this carbon-carbon bond is just the average between double bond and single bond length. So uh, let's test this formula for the case where we have three double bonds. We have one, two, three, four, five carbon-carbon bonds. Uh, let's look at this. It's two times three double bonds. That's six minus one is five. And yeah, that's the number of bonds that we counted um, in the number of carbon-carbon bonds that we counted as being um, the extent of my box. So something to have in mind because we're going to use that to make simplifications. Now we're going to be using the equation for the energy that corresponds to the particle in a box. Now remember that this one goes as n squared, where n is the energy level, and we have a bunch of constants. In the case of the length of the box, it's, it's going to be also a variable because we want to analyze how that box changes or how the energy changes also with the length of the box for each one of those uh, different compounds. But the transition, the change in the energy, then is going to correspond to the energy level n plus 1 squared minus n squared divided by the square of the box length and multiplied by this bunch of constants. So if we relate now the number or the energy level between the for the transitions with the number of bonds as we saw before, and we have this formulation right here. So the, the first one on the top corresponds to uh, the difference in energy between n plus 1 and n minus 1, each of those is squared, and the one in the bottom corresponds to the length of my box related to the number of double bonds, and here I'm already taking into account the fact that I have to multiply by the average carbon-carbon uh, bond distance. So these, as you can see, is a bunch of constants that I can just calculate one time, and then I can just work out with uh, relatively simple numbers. Now, this is the result I'm already taking into account and making the proper conversions from nanometers to meters. I'm taking the square and everything, the uh, particular values that I have for, for all those constants, and um, at the end, I have this value. Now, pay attention to these uh, unit analysis. Make sure, convince yourself that the units that I have written here are actually corresponding to joules, which is expected because these numbers are unitless, and then the change in energy should be in units of energy. In this case, the units will be joules. So this 
whole bunch of constants will have to come up with units. In that case, those units will be joules. So again, convince yourself that that is the case. Now let's do the first example. Whenever we have um, only one double bond, the change in energy for this transition between N1 and N2 is going to be equal to, um, the double bond is only one, so it's two times one plus one. On the bottom, the length is going to be uh, the length is going to be scaled by two plus one minus one. So what I have on the top, uh, remember this is just a constant, so I don't need to calculate it every time. It's just that constant. On top, I'm going to get a three, and in the bottom, I'm going to go one square, which is one. So is this constant times three, and I end up having this much energy. We can do the same calculation for whenever we have two double bonds, and then I'm not going to repeat all those calculations since I already know that this is a constant. Now I have two double bonds, it's 2 times 2 plus 1, that's 5, and the bottom is going to be 2 times 2 minus 1, so that's going to be 4 minus 1, 3, and that's a square. So when I take this value times this value, I end up getting about 1.7, 10 to the minus 18 joules. So now you can see what happens with the energy as the number of double bonds increase. Three double bonds, same substitutions, I end up with uh, the same constants. Now the same constant times 7 over 25 and I end up with this value. Now again look at the trend in the energy. It's decreasing from a single uh, from one double bond, two double bonds, three double bonds and so on. Let's do the calculations for any uh, for four double bonds. Again on top is 2 times 4 that's 8 plus 1 is 9. On the bottom is 2 times 4 that's 8 minus 1 is 7 and it goes square. When I do the calculation I end up with this amount of energy. Again lower energy than before when we have five double bonds, and I end up with even uh, lower energy. So you can see immediately what the trend is. Now, if you were to think about it in terms of the wavelength of absorption for those, what you're going to find is that uh, for the double bond equals one, the wavelength that corresponds to that absorption will be about 21 nanometers, and experimentally, that is 170 nanometers. It doesn't seem that good. And I will agree with you, it's not that great of a model, but remember, this is a very simple model that doesn't take into account anything else, just a particle in a box model, a huge simplification. We made a lot of assumptions, we made a lot of simplifications, and of course, this is not that great. But one thing that is going to be interesting is as you go for uh, other energy levels, of course, the discrepancy is still there. For example, when you have two double bonds, 116 versus 217, three double bonds, it gets a little better, you know, and four gets a little bit overestimating and so on. Again, the idea here is that it's not that it gives you exactly the same results as you will be expecting experimentally, since obviously this is a very crude model plus all the simplifications, but it gives you an idea of the ballpark where these absorptions in terms of the energy and the wavelengths are going to be located. And for sure, it's within the same order of magnitude. It is not by any means the correct number, but it's going to give you a very good idea of where the energy transition is going to be located. Roughly speaking, even in the same order of magnitude. So that's great. Uh, let's look at another example, this large molecule, beta carotene, uh, that again, look at the, uh, when we look at this structure, of course, we can think about, yeah, there's conjugated double bonds. So in a three-dimensional structure for this, and we're going to be considering that length where you have the double bonds conjugated as being the length of my box. Richer features now with this larger molecule. And of course, this model, the particle in a box, is not going to do a great job, but it's going to do a good job or good enough. So let's consider that. Now remember, we have 10 carbon carbon single bonds, 11 carbon double bond carbons that are alternating. We have a total of 22 carbons in that chain that corresponds to uh, my box uh, for this uh, particle in a box model. So we can count the number of carbon-carbon uh, bonds that I'm going to take into account in order to calculate the length of that box. Uh, and again, if we consider an average that every carbon-carbon bond is 140 picometers, that's going to give me, with this 21 carbon-carbon uh, bonds in this box, roughly a length of 2.94 nanometers. Now, the question is, we have to estimate what is the wavelength of the light that has been absorbed by this molecule whenever we have this uh, transition from its ground state to the next higher excited uh, state. And again, if we're just thinking in the simplistic model of having just uh, absorption between electrons in the pi bonds in my pi system, we will considering uh, HOMO and LUMO, uh, where HOMO is going to be equal to uh, the energy level of my particle in the box, and that's going to be N, the excitation is going to go to energy level N plus 1. So each carbon in the chain contributes with one p electron, then you have 22 p electrons, there are two of those electrons per pi orbital, so we have 11 pi orbitals that are going to be filled, and those are the 11 carbon-carbon, uh, carbon-double bond carbon. Uh, with that, remember this is another equation that we have, and this is just a different way to put it because here I'm using h bar instead of h, as in the previous example, but the results should be exactly the same. The only thing that we have to do is to 
put the right or the correct um, constants. Now, again, in terms of the number of double bonds, uh, the transition energy is going to be given by this bunch of, bunch of constants times two times the number of double bonds plus one. And remember that we can calculate this length of the box according to the average carbon-carbon bonding. So LUMO, in this case, is going to be uh, 12, which is D plus one. HOMO is going to be N equals 11, which is going to be equal to the number of double bonds. So when we make this, the proper substitutions with the proper constants, etc., et we end up calculating that, again, these number of double bonds, it's 11. 2 times 11 is 22, plus one is 23. We do all the multiplications that we need to do, and then we end up calculating that the change in energy is going to be roughly 1.6, 10 to the minus 19 joules. And also, uh, make sure that you do the unit analysis and convince yourself that all the units that I have here cancel and give you finally joules, since that's what it should be in terms of the energy, but convince yourselves, okay? And that energy, according to the formulation that we had before, is going to correspond to a wavelength of about 1200 nanometers. Now, again, experimentally, uh, it's known that these, um, this transition goes around 500 nanometers. Not great. But it's not too bad either, considering that the model is a huge simplification from the real distribution of electrons in these rather complicated molecules. Anyhow, the model works to a certain extent, gives you decent results, kind of on the same ballpark of experimental values, even though they're not necessarily the same, but as a good a first approximation, it's a model that works decently well. Now, if you use the formulation that we had before, where we had already defined this constant, we do the multiplication, and sure enough, we get exactly the same result. And here is one of the examples of the application of that particle in a box model to a type of molecules that you may be familiar with from your organic chemistry classes. These pi conjugated systems, where I take the extent of that conjugation as the size of the box, and I'm thinking about electrons that can be delocalized, moving around the extent of that carbon chain. Okay, that was one example. Please let me know if you have any questions.